Have you ever asked yourself, is it worth it? Undoubtedly, that question has been asked uh, more times than we could ever count in all kinds of different contexts that we can even think about. But how does one conclude if something's worth it or not? You know, we all have different value systems. We all have a value system. There is something or there is someone that you are willing to sacrifice for based on a perceived benefit that awaits. And we conclude that because of our value system that it is worth it. For example, I've shared some of this before. Is it really worth it? This was the title of an article written a few years ago on a website for women called Our Vanity. And the article, in the article, the author proceeded to debate the pros and cons of having your lip pierced. And it reads like this, quote, Piercing can be done in different ways. Almost all kinds of lip piercings heal pretty fast, but they require you to be very cautious. Lip piercing is not an easy process, and very often infection accompanies it. You may be very careful. You have to be very careful about the pierced area at all times, especially during the healing period. Swelling is common, uh, a common symptom experienced after oral piercing. But you can make it seem smaller by pushing a larger ring or stud into the pierced area. When the swelling vanishes, you may wear the jewelry you want. Another thing to mention here is that the lip piercing can be hazardous for your teeth and gums if you wear jewelry that is not an initial piece. Try to avoid the lip ring touching the gums as it can damage them or cause inflammation. Before you've done the piercing, make sure that you're fully aware of its harmful effects. If you consider it worth bearing all that, go for it. But if you doubt, my advice is to find other ways of making yourself look interesting rather than running the risk. End of quote. And so she laid out her case, and there was a place there um, for people to write comments. Um, and what I found interesting is I read these comments that were left is that, <coughs> that the overwhelming majority perceived that whatever hardship or inconvenience that they may have encountered by having a pierced lip, wearing the lip ring was worth it. And that included some who had chipped teeth, all kinds of infections, um, all kinds of problems they had with it. It was worth it. And so where does someone get a perspective like that? Well, it's part of a value system that each person embraces. You and I have a value system. We always make decisions that are consistent with our value system, regardless of personal cost or lack thereof. It's really our value system that drives us when it comes right down to it. And all of us, whether we're conscious of it or not, have a value system in place in which we're willing to suffer hardship for a particular goal. Or if the goal is pain avoidance, our value system will cause us to act in accord with that. But, you know, we can be deceived when it comes to... A, really understanding what our goal is. For example, your goal, if you were in college, might be to get an A, but when you get a glimpse at the cost involved, perhaps, you realize maybe that's not the best goal, and so you adjust your goal to something that, in your estimation, is more reasonable, something that perhaps costs less. And though we, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, may state publicly or in our minds that our goal is to, to <clears throat> do something that requires a certain level of cost, when that cost exceeds what we think it should in our minds, we'll say, forget it. And how many believers have done that very thing? The idea is, I'm going to serve Jesus Christ. I know there's going to be some cost, but then when the cost associated with living for the Savior reaches a certain level, we're not willing to pay it. And what we did there is then reveal where our value system really is. And oftentimes we do this because by nature we want to be in control. We want to dictate the terms in which we're going to function. And we do this in every realm that we exist in. But when it comes to living for the Savior, there's to be a different mindset. One that willingly and energetically relinquishes control of our lives to our loving Father because of the great love wherewith He loved us and His plan and His purpose for our lives, which cannot be improved upon. You know, Christ made it plain in a, <clears throat> that if you are going to do his will, it is going to involve some hardship. And yet that hardship is to be embraced with joy because Christ makes it clear in his word that it is worth it. And what it boils down to is having a supernatural perspective that exhibits the mind of Christ. This is why the Hebrew believers who were waning in their desire to live for the Savior we're, we're admonished to do what? To look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who noticed for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So there was a perspective there that he had, and that's what we are to embrace. He, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and he's now sat down at the right hand of God. And though it was the most painful, painful thing imaginable for, to go through for Christ, taking upon himself sin and your filth and my filth and bearing the equivalent of hell for the likes of us, nothing thrilled him more than to offer himself willingly as a sacrifice because that was in accord with his Father's will and that was consistent with his value system. Why did he do it? You know, Christ wasn't in it for himself, so to speak, on a human selfish level because it would be the hardest thing in the world to do. He was in it because of who he is in essence and to demonstrate the depths of his love for you and for me and for the whole world. It was consistent with his value system to offer himself as the Lamb of God, to willingly and completely shed his blood so that our sins could be once and for all forgiven, that we could be completely accepted in Christ and have a position of blessing for all eternity. Amazing. Nothing thrilled him more because of the love and the desire to honor his Father. And so as we're admonished to do this, the next verse says we are to notice, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest what? you become weary and discouraged in your souls. And there's many believers that become weary and discouraged in their souls because they're missing the big picture and they've adopted a wrong value system. Again, if Jesus Christ was all about himself and all about protecting himself and exalting himself and in terms of how the world values this kind of exaltation, he would have never gone to the cross for he would have been in it for himself. He would have avoided the pain and agony he would have concluded that it was not worth it. Why bother? But he chose to do it for it was worth it. I mean, how would it have benefited him to go through the things he suffered on a personal level? But because Jesus is God and God is love, Christ despised the shame and became a propitiation for our sins. And this is where life starts. This is where life starts for the unbeliever, and this is where life starts even for the believer. One of my favorite gospel book, uh, verses is 1 John 4, 9, and 10, because love of God is described very acutely. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, and that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, farthest thing from it, but he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And notice, the, God's love being manifested is equated with him sending his Son. The love of God is not equated to the absence of a just penalty in hell. It's the, equated with the God providing what is necessary for mankind to escape the hell he deserves. And the issue was our sins. And so if we look at the, again, it says, God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might notice live through him. There was a purpose there. We can't have life outside of Jesus Christ. God loved us and sent his son. What's the purpose? be propitiation for our sins. And so what we conclude then is that life from God is related to a propitiation for our sins. And we need to understand that. Now, sin means to miss the mark. God demands a bullseye 100% of the time, and we fall short. We miss lock, stock, and barrel. God has made that painfully obvious by expressing to us his holy righteous standard through the law. And as we evaluate ourselves against what God sends in his word, and we do this even just in a cursory manner, we conclude, if we're objective with ourselves, that we are guilty of breaking God's laws. And this indicates and, and reinforces the reality that we're dead to God, we have no relationship with him because of our trespasses and sins, and that we've done things that are worthy of death as the wages of sin is death. And what this really means is that every individual that has ever lived on this planet outside of Christ is worthy to be separated from God forever in an unthinkable place of horror called hell. And I just uh, recently uh, been going through the book of Revelation and I talked about the lake of fire. And I read a poem that said the first six days in hell that someone wrote, I don't know, 15 years ago or so. And it was so staggering to me, I stayed awake most of that night as I pictured my mother enduring one day in hell. And it was very bothersome to me. And I think oftentimes we 
forget the enormous price that Christ paid in order for us to escape the enormity of horror that we indeed deserve. This is amazing love. It's unfathomable. And yet the reality is, is that one day those that are not saved are going to depart into everlasting fire that was originally prepared for the devil and his angels. See, the Bible says the God of the universe became a man in Jesus Christ, and he suffered, and he died on the cross for your sins and mine so that we could be set free. It's very simple. We broke God's laws, and yet he paid our fine, and he paid our penalty in full. This is amazing grace, amazing love. He became a propitiation for our sins, a satisfactory payment. What God demanded, Christ satisfied, all in love. And so the offer is being made here, because Christ loved you and did this for you, is that if you're willing to believe on him, which means to trust or rely upon, you won't perish in hell, though you deserve to, but you will have forever everlasting life. He who believes, notice, will have everlasting life. And notice, he who does not believe stands condemned, not because he's a filthy sinner, but because he, in his He's rejected the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's rejected his person. He will not accept what Christ did for him. He will put his faith in something that cannot save him, whether it be his religious rituals, his baptism, his prayer life, his self-righteousness, whatever it might be, and he will end up in hell. See, God offers a great exchange. He offers your sin for his righteousness. That's the best deal in the universe. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He, God, made him Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. And so as you stood before God as a sinner, you were minus righteousness, you were full of sins, and again, you were deserving of hell. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ, who was perfect righteousness, did this for mankind. He took your sins and my sins and put them upon himself. And because he paid the price in full, God raised him from the dead. He lives forevermore. And the individual who chooses to place 100% of the trust in him gets Christ's righteousness put to him as count. He is now fit for heaven. He could spend eternity in a place of unexplainable and unfathomable blessing all by the grace of God and all to the glory of God. And we deserve none of it. See, Christ was the propitiation. He cried out, it is finished, paid in full. The question is, will you believe it? Will you trust him? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amazing. Amazing that God would do that. But because God is love and perfect justice, Christ is love and perfect justice, and he functioned in a way that was consistent with his value system, which means he said no to himself, he said yes to God, and he died for you and for me. Jesus Christ always made decisions that were consistent with his value system. And again, you live and I live according to our value system. Your decisions display your value system. And so the question becomes, well, what is it? Where is it derived from? What standard are you using? If you're familiar with the New Testament, you recognize that Christ made it very clear even to his disciples that in this world we will have tribulation, that the world is going to hate you, that you are going to suffer. You'll be asked to suffer. Paul told, reminded the Philippians from a jail cell, he says, for to you it has been granted, that means given as a gift, not only the privilege of believing on Christ, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me. As everywhere Paul went, he had conflict. And now here is in me, as he's still in conflict in a jail. And so the question is, to what degree are you willing to suffer for your Savior? And again, that depends on your value system. How much suffering should I endure? Are there to be no limits? And the answer is, there is to be no limits. Well, why? Why do you say that? Well, I can give you two very good reasons. One, Christ will never leave you or forsake you, and he said his grace would be sufficient. And what Peter is impressing these believers with is in the end, it will be worth it. See, God has unequivocally promised you that you will not be tested or tempted above what you're able to endure, that his comfort will be commensurate with your suffering. And in the, in the, in the end, because you're in Christ, That means suffering for Christ is not in vain, and it'll be worth it all when you see Jesus. But, you know, frankly, most of us have put limits on what we're willing to suffer. I mean, if we have a choice in the matter. And some of us have put very tight limits on. In fact, some believers think they're entitled to an easy life, and the whole prospect of suffering for Christ is not even on their radar screen. 
And frankly, I mean, none of us really knows what it is to appreciably experience suffering for Christ. Here in America, we'd have to spend time in the Sudan or perhaps Iraq or, South, or North Korea, and then maybe we get a taste of it. See, for too many of us, especially here in America, convenience is the order of the day. And if serving the Savior means I have to put myself out even a little, or maybe someone will even think I'm a weirdo or unloving, I'm not going to do it. I mean, how many believers, instead of considering it a privilege to gather with God's people and to pray together and to sing together and to look into the Word of God and to fellowship with another, will blow that off because they don't feel like getting out of bed today? or they saw a snowflake, or the temperature hit uh, three below. Big deal. And then we say forget it, because all of us have a price in which we're willing to sell out Jesus Christ, and for some of us, it's just not very high. Not high at all. And so to help us see what the value in suffering, we have the book of 1 Peter, and he wrote this epistle to let us know to whatever degree you and I are called to suffer, it is worth it. And not only are you to humbly submit to unjust suffering as Christ did, you are to exhibit God-honoring behavior in the power of the Spirit so that you have a platform by which you can witness for the Savior in the face of that suffering. See, Peter wants to tell us here about having hope and exhibiting holiness in a very hostile world that has painted a bullseye on believers because of the God of this world. But Peter... And seeking to encourage these saints who are suffering, begins this epistle by reminding these believers to praise God, the Father, for his matchless salvation. You can pick it up in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to him, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved perfectly in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And so if you ponder just a few things mentioned in this verse here, you first of all recognize that according to God's abundant mercy, verse 3, he gave you a new birth. He gave you an abundant life, an eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And though this abundant life that he's given you will be fully manifested when you physically die and reside in heaven and beyond. He says, right now you have a living hope. Do you notice that in verse 3? Not a dead hope. A dead hope is a false hope. It's hoping spring shows up or something like that. No, it's is a living hope. It's a confident assurance that what you've been promised by your Savior will one day be realized. And this is, again, designed to Keep your eyes on Christ, looking on to Jesus. Whatever trials you face, whatever, we can praise God because we have a living hope that rests on the sure fact that Christ rose from the dead. Because he lives, we sing the song, we can face tomorrow. And again, this provides the impetus to endure whatever you might have to endure in time for the sake of your Savior. In fact, on top of all that, he says that you have an inheritance waiting for you in heaven. And the adjectives he uses to describe it are, is that it's imperishable, that it's unstained, and that it will not fade away or lose value over time, unlike your 401k or whatever it might be that you have your hope in. It's reserved in heaven for you right now. It, you are being kept perfectly by the power of an almighty God. You're perfectly secure in him until you get there. It's amazing. And so the fact is, is that the present operation of God's preserving power in our lives anticipates the goal specified in the phrase until the coming of the salvation which is ready to be revealed in the last time. See, God has got you preserved and it's, he's got an inheritance reserved until you get there. It's waiting upon your arrival. And so Peter sets the stage there and then he brings us to verse 6 and he tells us something. In this you greatly rejoice. In this you greatly rejoice. See, or you're to greatly rejoice for this match of salvation, and this is to be true even in the face of severe trials. In fact, he says the word this there, the question we could ask is, what does this refer to? And I think it refers to everything he's mentioned here in verses 3 through 5. Causing us to be born again to a living hope, keeping an inheritance for us in heaven, and keeping us for that in heaven 
inheritance. We are to be rejoicing in this. You are to rejoice in what's awaiting for you in heaven. See, our joy is based on the glory of our future with God and the certainty that we will make it there. That is to produce joy. Now, what's interesting here is Peter does not use the word for your average run-of-the-mill joy, if you will. He uses the word greatly rejoice. This is a unique word. It's Greek word agaleo. And it literally means to jump much, to leap for joy, to skip, to be happy with excitement, to be exceedingly joyful, exuberantly happy. You should be jumping up and down on the inside because of this great salvation. Ecstatic joy, leaping, skipping. In fact, to put it in context, this is how Christ used this word earlier in Matthew chapter 5. He said, rejoice, and here the word is translated, be exceedingly glad. Why? For great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In the context of suffering for the Savior, he told these individuals that he was speaking to to rejoice and be exceedingly glad. This is to be the mindset that you and I have. Are you rejoicing in your salvation today? Are you exceedingly joyful because of that reality? And he says that in verse 6, though, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. This joy becomes somewhat paradoxical in that it is to be present when grief is present as well. This is how God designed this thing to work. And see, so you need to recognize some truth about trials here. It's very clear from the Word of God that trials to be expected. And what shocks most of us is that when a trial comes, we go into shock. We just don't expect them to be there. For some reason, we buy into this false assumption that everything should go relatively smooth for me because God loves me. No trial should be expected. They're a reality. They're part of God's plan for your life. They're inescapable. I mean, merely from the standpoint that you live in a sin-cursed world, and on top of that, like these believers were, they were suffering not only because of just that's how life goes, but they were suffering because they were a Savior. And James made this clear. He says, my brethren, count it all joy. He didn't say if, but when you fall into various trials. Trials are to be expected. This is how you and I are to think. It's not an if question, it's a when question. Sometimes you see them coming, sometimes you don't. Regardless, God is sovereign over them. God is for you, he's not against you. He's working out all things after the counsel of his own will. And this includes your trials, as your times are in his hands and he's in perfect control. And so God in his sovereignty will provide trials and suffering. He's considered them a divine necessity. It's funny, I, I read a little blurb here where a guy was applying for insurance and it list said for accidents, and he said he's, he hasn't had any accidents, and when they went to check on him, he had all kinds of them. And he says, why do you write no accidents? He says, all those were planned events, he said. He says, God arranged this and God arranged that. There are no accidents. For some reason, they didn't share his perspective. But trials are a reality. But trials are also temporary. It says in verse 6 that, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you're grieved by various trials. Notice, for a little while. It's one word in the Greek, which means small in number or little in amount. This is only a little while. Now, when you're in the middle of something that's very distressing, it hardly seems that way, but from God's perspective, it's for a little while. And this is why it's so crucial to grasp. Focusing on your living hope is paramount when it comes to victory, especially over a trial that seemingly has no end. And this is obvious, trials are grieving. It says, though now, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. And the word grieve there speaks of pain of mind. It means to cause one to experience severe mental or emotional distress, which may be accompanied by sadness, sorrow, or grief. And so this is not inflicted with physical pain, but this is mental and emotional pain. It's inward distress or grief caused by outward circumstances. You know, it's okay to be grieved. God understands that we are not robots in any way, shape, or form. He's given us emotions. He has emotions, and we are grieved. Trials are grieving. To say anything else would be a false statement. 
In fact, you might be under God's loving discipline this morning. And it says, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. God it recognizes that chastisement is painful. But nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so we also note here that trials are necessary. It's part of the package you get when you get saved. If need be is a great word. It means a logical necessity, not of a moral obligation. It's we must rather than we ought. It speaks of an obligation out of intrinsic necessity or inevitability. Trials are a must. That's the way God designed it to be. And you know, as I read this and thought about this more, sorrow in trials is necessary as well. Same Greek word, same application. Trials are going to cause sorrow. Now, now, all trials are obviously not especially sorrowful, but there's certainly those that are, and God deems them necessary, as we're going to see why in just a minute. Now, trials are also variable. This is the Greek word that means various kinds or modes, diversified, manifold, variegated, many-colored. It was used to describe the skin of a leopard, the different colored veining of marble or an embroidered robe, various strains of music, and so forth. And so our trials are certainly different, and God knows the trial you need. He knows the trial I need. And you know, we are different. What might be considered difficult for some might not be so much for others, because you have an area of strength and weakness, and I've got an area of strength and weakness. We're not all equally affected by the same thing. We have different needs. The point is, is God knows what we need. He knows how much we can take, and so forth. But why are they there? What purpose do they serve? And verse 7 really brings this into attention. Peter shows us the purpose of trials, the perspective needed in trials, and the final product of trials in this verse. See, verse 7 opens up with the word that. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tried by fire or tested by fire, may be found to the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you are to understand God's purpose in trials. God wants you to know what the purposes are. And the word that points to the purpose of the various trials. It's a Hena clause, purpose clause in the Greek. And the purpose is that your faith might be tested or refined like gold to remove the dross so that the coming of Christ there will be praise, honor, and glory. That's this in a nutshell right there. That your faith might be tested or refined like gold to remove the dross so that at the coming of Christ there'll be praise, there'll be honor, and there'll be glory. You know, isn't it wonderful that regardless of what comes into your life that you can recognize in the grand scheme of things that there's a purpose behind it? I mean, in so many cases, the unsaved are suffering much worse than you and I are, and yet they have no answers. They see no purpose. They can't acknowledge the hand of God in this. They can't see that it's working together for good, and yet you and I have the privilege of doing just that. So what exactly is being tested here? Well, first of all, your faith is being tested. Your faith is being tested. We're saved by faith. We walk by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so God wants to test your faith, and he does so with a trial. Well, what are we talking about when we're talking about trial? Trial is a Greek word periosmos, and it can be translated temptation or test or trial, depending on the context. But it describes the idea of putting something to the test and refers to the test or pressures that come in order to discover the quality of something. See, trials are designed to test your faith. And that's why we have the phrase there in verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith... Now, when you read that word genuineness, it seems to say that, well, if you pass the test or the trial, that somehow that gives an indication that your faith is real or it's genuine in the sense that you're really saved, and yet it's not what it means at all. See, genuous is the Greek word dokamazo, and it means approved. It means tested and found approved. It describes both the process of determining the genuineness, and the issue is the quality of something, or the result, the latter specifically referring to the genuineness or the quality of something as a result of testing. It means putting to the test for the purposes of approving. 
and finding that the person tested meets the specifications prescribed so as to put one's approval on them. You know, just to get an idea of how this word is used, notice Romans 28. Mankind did not approve of having God in knowledge. It's not a test to see whether God is real or not, or genuine or not. The issue is, do I approve of what God says? And the unsaved, well, said no, and so God gave them up to a disapproved mind, to do the things not seemingly. That's Jung's literal translation. So the issue is not, is your faith real, but is it approved? Are you approved through the test? It's not a test to see if you're legitimately saved. The context here is about walking by faith and making your life count for Christ in time as a believer. It's because you're already saved. It's because you're rejoicing in that salvation you already possess. And so when it comes to living your Christian life, what is the point of it if your faith is not going to be tested? What would you need your faith for? Faith needs to be tested, and your faith in particular needs to be tested. Otherwise, you walk by sight. You seek to be self-sufficient. And faith in Christ is not really needed. So God says, I'm going to test your faith, but he's doing it for your benefit. And the result is that he wants us to be approved. You're already accepted at him, but he wants your life to count by depending on Christ so that when the dust settles and the smoke clears, you are approved and so forth. And so why does God test our faith? Relative to the end result, he wants us to be approved. He wants you to stand before him as approved. But there's also a process to it. And so relative to the process of the testing, God says, I'm going to test your faith to reveal where you are at. In other words, what your faith is in. God is going to test your faith to reveal where you're at. You know, it could be your faith is in something that has no business being. It could be in your performance. It could be in your good grades. It could be in some aspect of your circumstances. It could be in your bank account or your good looks or the government or whatever it might be. And yet all these things are not worthy objects of your faith. They're prone to and eventually will fail. And so your trial is designed to reveal what's going on in your heart so you would think properly. Notice what after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, what God said to the nation of Israel that failed miserably. And you should remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And so a trial has a way of revealing something. What is it you really want? What's going on in your heart? Is it all about you or is it about God? Is it about the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it about you getting what you want? Or is it about doing the Lord's will for his glory? God will give you a trial or a test to see what it is you really want. It will show you if you're willing to compromise a biblical principle or wait upon the Lord for his deliverance. And so he might cause you to lose your money. But in doing so, you might gain some devotion to God you wouldn't have before. You could lose your health. And yet God says, through that, I'm going to teach you compassion. You could lose your job. But then through that, God says, I can give you a clearer purpose for your life. You could lose a loved one, and yet you could, through the grieving process, gain a practical hope. You could lose your friends, and yet gain a friend who sticks closer than a brother. God gives you these things to see what's in your heart, what it is you want. It will show where your value system really is. Who is your all in all? It shows us what you love. Trials always show us what we love. It shows us what, we're, or what our idols are. And what is an idol? An idol is anything you refuse to put down for the sake of Jesus Christ. It's pretty simple, really. In fact, an idol is where you run to for comfort when you're hurting. It's where your money goes. It's where your time is spent is where your loyalty lies. And so evaluate. Who's your God? You know, I got something that works every time. You show me your calendar and your checkbook, and I'll tell you what your idol is. Because you always make time and spend money for what you think is important. 
it never fails. And you see, God is going to give you a trial to expose your idols so he can tear them down because he wants your life to count. And this gives us the second reason why God gives us a trial. Not only does it reveal where your faith is at, but it refines your faith for the purposes of growth. And we can use again the Exodus generation as an example. The next verse in Deuteronomy 8.3 says, So because God wanted to see where your heart was, he humbled you, he allowed you to hunger, he fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you learn something. What's that? That man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so God's going to give you a trial to not only find out what's in your heart, but then to change it for the better, to get refocused and recalibrated on him so your life counts. And to emphasize his point, Peter here compares the refining of your faith with the refining of gold, verse 7. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold which perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found in the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, he compares the refining of your faith with the refining of gold. See, without dependence upon Christ, you're not honoring your Savior. And that's what you've been left here to do, to abide in Christ and allow the principles of the Word of God to direct your thinking so that you can do the will of God for His glory. And God's going to put you in His refiner so that it happens. You know, when the gold refiner puts gold into the fire, he doesn't do it to destroy it, but to make it pure, to make it of a better quality, to give it more value. James Vernon McGee summed this up well. He said, when God tests us today, he puts us into the furnace. He doesn't do it to destroy us or to hurt or to harm us, but he wants pure gold, and that's the way he will get it. Friend, that is what develops Christian character. At the time of testing, the dross is drawn off and the precious gold appears. That is God's method. That is God's school. We don't hear that teaching very much in our day. Rather, we are being taught to become sufficient within ourselves. Oh, my friend, you and I are not adequate. We are not sufficient, and we will never be. We simply come to God as sinners, and he saves us by his grace through the blood of Christ, Then he wants us to live his life through us. He tries to teach us this through our trials. He's drawing us closer to him. Very well said. From a human perspective, you might very think, well, trials mess up my life. They stifle me. They don't help me one bit at all. And yet, from God's perspective, trials are the very thing that you need to develop you. You know, Peter is ultimately focusing on the end result here when you stand before the Lord. But when James talked about trials, he emphasized the profit, the, uh, the process. He said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. In other words, there's a process to this. That's why he says, let patience have its what? Perfect work. There's a process to it. And the process, though, so in time, you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James says, you've got to let the trial run its course. God's working in you and through you. That's James' emphasis, but Peter's emphasis here is primarily when you stand before the Lord, when the dust settles and the smoke clears. See, God wants you to grow spiritually, and this cannot happen apart from testing. Again, what is the point of having faith if it's not going to be tested? And your faith needs to be tested. You know, in the academic world, in school, you're tested to see whether or not you know what you're supposed to know, and it reveals what you don't know. And they've proven through countless studies that if there is not a test administered, studying doesn't take place, and learning is dramatically reduced. Isn't that amazing? Who here would study if they did not have a test, right? I know most of us would not. God knows that too, so he gives a test. And so James makes it clear why trials are necessary. So you can have spiritual strength and endurance. Without resistance and testing, that which is alive does not get stronger. If you don't use your muscles, they atrophy. We all know academically, if you do not use it, you lose it. And yet, God is saying the opposite is true. When we use our muscles to get stronger, we exercise our minds, we reap the benefits of that. And he says, if I give you opportunities to exercise your faith in me, you're going to grow through that. You're going to see things regarding God that you wouldn't see otherwise. And so he brings trials to strengthen your life and to build character into you because he loves you. And again, the trials and the tests, 
If there weren't those, you wouldn't apply the truth of God's word to your life and you would miss out. So trials refine your faith, your motives, your knowledge of God's word. They reveal your heart and your insufficiency. They show you what you truly love. In fact, if God sends trials and tests in your life, you can either welcome them or you can run from them. And you can run, but you can't hide. I mean, you can stick your head in the sand and hopefully when you pull it out, the thing has gone away, but that doesn't work real well. Again, when you have a test at school, you either pass or fail them, and that's true with the tests of life. You know, when trouble comes, you can either turn to God in prayer or you can become bitter. Which one's it going to be? Job chapter 1 is classic. When that severe trial hit, his wife got bitter and told him to curse God and die. And yet James 1 says, Job worshiped. Those are your options. You know, you can become quiet and thoughtful when it comes, or you can become harsh and cruel. You can learn new trust in God, or you can rebel against him. You can take courage knowing who God is and what he's provided, or you can cower in fear. You can draw close to God, or you can turn away from him. It's interesting how the same event can have vastly different results depending on how we respond. And so Peter compares the refining of gold with the refining of your faith, but he also has a contrast here as well. He's contrasting the refining of your faith with the refining of gold. How is that? Well, two contrasts are mentioned here. He says the refining of your faith, notice, is more precious than gold. It's more precious. There's a contrast. I mean, no one's going to debate the value of gold. It's considered a precious metal. And yet the word precious here means of a great price or value. A great price or value. You know, as far as God is concerned, he says the refining or testing of your faith is of great, priceless, precious value. And he's saying, you know what, the refining of gold, which makes the gold pure, doesn't hold a candle to the refining process of your faith to be approved. Because when the dust settles and the smoke clears to be approved by God for passing the test has infinitely more value than the gold. Do you believe that? Do you believe that becoming more like Christ in time through the process of trial is more valuable than an easy life where there's plenty of gold? See, money doesn't make the man, character does, and character, Christ-like character, is only built through faith. And so the refining of your faith is more precious than gold. And he also mentions the refining of your faith has value for eternity, but gold perishes. He says, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire. See, gold perishes. It really has no ultimate value. Someone said it this way, to be tried with fire, he says, the gold will bear the action of the fire for any given time, even millions of years, were they possible, without losing the smallest particle of weight or value. Yet even gold in the process of time will wear away by continual use, and the earth and all its works will be burnt up by that supernatural fire whose action nothing can resist. But on that day, the faith of Christ's fathers will be found brighter, and more glorious. And so, God is in the business of giving you a trial to refine your faith, but it's more than that. God is going to reward your tested faith, and he wants you to know this, and he wants I to know this. It's going to be rewarded. Now, God's not only going to reward your, he's going to reward it on two fronts. He's going to reward you in time, is he going to reward you in eternity? He's going to reward you in time, and he's going to reward you in eternity. And how is he going to reward you in time? With spiritual blessings that you would otherwise not have known. Well, what's he going to reward me with time? Like what? How about the need to learn God's word and promises? What did the psalmist say? He says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. Why? so I can learn something about God that I wouldn't otherwise learn. How about the opportunity to experience God's comfort in your difficulties? 
What does 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 say? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who what? Comforts us in all our tribulation. Have you experienced the comfort of God? That's what a trial is all about. So you can experience God's comfort, but it doesn't stop there. <clears throat> it get, he blesses you with an opportunity to learn the way to spiritually minister to others. What does that verse say again? Not only does he comfort us in all our tribulation, that we what? What purpose? Might be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the same comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. So you can be an instrument of God's comfort to someone else. You ever stop and think that God might give you a trial for the sole purpose so that you can learn to be an instrument of his comfort to someone else? Isn't that worth it? It's worth it if you see yourself as a vessel of God. If you see your life as something to hang on to and clutch, you're not going to embrace that perspective at all. But God says, I'm going to give you a blessing through this trial so you can be a blessing to someone else. Now you have to, in your value system, is it worth it? If you say no, I can tell you right now you're miserable. That's just the way it is. What else? With the opportunity to learn about God's sufficient grace to meet your spiritual needs. How are you going to learn that God's grace is sufficient if it's not put to the test? You can't. What did Paul say? Not that I speak to regard the need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. And so I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. Everywhere in all things, that's the whole gamut. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul, how'd you learn that? Because I got to taste and see that the Lord is good in my trials. Wow. And you know what? His grace was sufficient. You have the privilege now of glorifying God instead of yourself in your life. You know, you default to what about me, and it's all about me. And so you need trials to realize it's not about you. It's about Christ, and you have the opportunity to glorify him. And you have the privilege of growing in the grace and knowledge of the Savior. That's what it's all about. Spurgeon argues, he says, if a Christian doesn't go through those times when he's depressed, he will grow proud. He won't be able to relate to others who suffer. He will miss lessons that we learn no other way. Do you believe that? That's how God works. But you see, with regard to eternity, he rewards you there as well. And what's that reward going to be? The result of your approved faith will be praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Isn't that where seven ends? That the genuineness or the approval of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Now people say, well, whose glory is this? Obviously, Christ is worthy of all glory in the whole universe. But there's a secondary sense in which God will reward his children at the coming of at the coming of Christ with praise and glory and honor. Isn't that amazing? James tried to encourage those suffering saints with these words. He says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has provided to those who love him. You know, those who love him are going to look to him and wait upon him and go through the trial and see him glorified. See, the praise that he's talking about here is praise given to God's children whose faith has stood the testing fires. It's the well done, thou good and faithful servant. Paul mentioned this to the carnal Corinthians. He said, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. More of it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you as they were running him into the ground or in human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. Now, I know nothing against myself, but this doesn't justify myself. He who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness. He will reveal the counsel of the hearts. Then each one's praise notice will come from God. Can you imagine being praised by God? Are you kidding? And yet, if you're willing to embrace Christ and embrace the trial and go through it and see him honored and glorified and be used as a vessel through that whole thing, he's going to say, well done. He's going to give you praise. 
That's crazy. That's amazing. Our approved faith will come to its crown in a manifestation of praise and glory and honor. I mean, look at the people that run these marathons, and they, and they got people waiting for them at the end of it, and they're, they say, oh, congratulations, you made it. You worked so hard, and it paid off. Well, we're running an infinitely more important race, and Christ is going to be there at the finish line saying, well done, you made it. And how many of us are going to go to the third mile and say, well, forget it. You know, and go have another donut, right? Or whatever it might be. Wow. And you know, God's going to show you that all the time that you were through this, that He was using you in a way that you didn't know, perhaps. It would be found to praise and glory. You'd be found that in ways He was so merciful that he'd plan this not only for your good and someone else's good, but for his glory. And he's going to thank you for being willing to do that. Do you see the big picture? Is your value system what it needs to be? Job went through many painful trials, all of them with God's approval. And he understood the big picture. He said, but he knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I'm going to come forth as gold. It's going to be worth it all when I see Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you have an eye on eternity? These saints that Peter's addressing are suffering. I mean, we're talking about getting thrown to the lions. We're talking about suffering in ways that are, we can't even imagine. And he's saying, oh, it's going to be worth it. Stick it out. In fact, he, notice verse 8 here. Whom having seen and rep- not seen and reverend to Christ, notice you love. And though you don't see him now, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. This is called a walk of faith. Receiving the end of the, your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know, there's a present dynamic that can turn suffering into glory today. Peter gave us four directions here to to enjoy glory now, even in the midst of trials. He says, love Christ. Isn't that what he says in verse 8? Whom having not seen, you love. See, the issue is, are you having a love affair with your Savior? Are you abiding in Him? Are you abiding in His love? Are you considering Him and what He went through for the likes of you and how He lives to intercede for you? That he'll never leave you or forsake you. That he never tests you above what you're able. That he's got a purpose in it that doesn't have to be in vain. The Holy Spirit has poured out God's love in your heart and we return that love by faith as we walk with him. We need to worship him. See, as you love Christ in your trial, it takes the poison and pain out of the experience and he replaces it with healing medicine. See, Satan always wants you to focus on the negative. He wants the trial to bring out the worst in us, but God wants to bring out his best in us and through us. And the test will be, do I love myself more or do I love Christ more? And instead of the trial then burning you, it'll purify you. That's the test. He also says, trust Christ, verse 8. Whom having not seen you love, though now you don't see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable. You have to walk by faith and not by sight. It's about trusting him to see his hand in every circumstance, in every consequence. You know, when you love someone, you trust them. And faith and love together help to strengthen hope. And then you rejoice in Christ. It says, yet believing you what? Rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You know, you can only rejoice in circumstances for a short time because they're just going to change. But you can rejoice in Christ all the time by centering your heart and your mind on Him. The word greatly rejoice, there's the same word in verse 6. You greatly rejoice in Christ. And finally, you recognize you're going to receive from Christ. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Are you willing to trust him? 
to receive him? Are you willing to wait upon him? Charles Spurgeon used to say, little faith will take your soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to your soul. It's well said, isn't it? And so the question is, is it worth it? What's your value system? You know, I began by using that, put the picture of a girl there that had a pierced lip and then referred to the article and, and the overwhelming comments of those who read the article said it was worth the pain, the infection, the chipped teeth, whatever else, to have a stud coming out of your lower lip. And you know, that's all going to go up in smoke and it doesn't mean a hill of beans. And yet, when you've got a value system that says Christ is more important than I am, I'm going to say it's worth it. I'm going to say I'm going to live for the Lord Jesus Christ like that beautiful song, Embrace the Cross. What a beautiful song that communicated this very truth right here. Embrace the cross. It's worth it right there. Everything you see around you is going to dissolve one day. What's going to go on to eternity is your tested faith. In fact, after what our Lord endured 2,000 years ago, how could we ever say, I can't believe this has happened to me? Someone said, before our, our trials, our faith is unproved. After our trials, our faith is improved. And that's how God designed it to be. Do you believe it's worth it all? Are you willing to say no to your flesh? Are you willing to present yourself to your Savior out of the mercy he's shown you as a living sacrifice? And allow him to dictate whatever sacrifices come your way. It's your reasonable service. And in the end, you will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And when you stand before Christ, you can actually hear, amazingly, praise from him. What a perspective to embrace. Our life can count. It doesn't have to be a vain show. What an encouragement. And again, think about the context here. These saints who have in many cases, lost anything. They've been falsely accused. They've been asked to submit to slave masters that can beat them or kill them in a, for no particular reason at all. I mean, things that we can't even wrap our minds around. And yet, it's going to be worth it all when you see Jesus. Do you believe that? Allow Christ to form your value system into one that's eternal so that your life counts by his grace. Let's pray.